2014 was a year of triumphant success and triumphant failure. But for now, I'm taking a look back at some of my personal favorites of the last year. Let's leave the negativity for another video because, well, let's be honest, 2014 had some pretty big flops. That said, here are my personal top 10 games of 2014. seem to forget about this one, but yes, Strider did in fact release earlier this year. Back in February, the scarf-clad Future Ninja made its current and next-gen debut with the Double Helix reboot that blended both the fast-paced action of the Sega Genesis release along with the Metroid-esque exploration-heavy gameplay of the NES game. Backed with a unique visual style, silky smooth mechanics, updated bosses, and a fantastic soundtrack full of remixes, the Strider reboot was one of the best action platformers of 2014. Of course, only one of, as this list is just getting started. You know, if it wasn't for an astoundingly misleading Eurogamer video, MGS fans might have enjoyed this game to its fullest extent. Sadly, everyone believed, and still believes, that Metal Gear Solid V Ground Zeroes is just an overpriced, underwhelming gameplay demo that can be completed in just 10 minutes. Yep, at the end of the day, Ground Zeroes is just 10 minutes long. Pay no attention to side missions, the hidden collectibles, player-driven narrative, the refined stealth mechanics, adaptive AI, optional objectives, unlockable costumes, developer cameos, more side missions and unlockables granted upon completing the game at higher difficulties, the DLC missions, which are free. Anyway, Ground Zeroes is fantastic. I mean, if you enjoy the Metal Gear franchise, there's really absolutely no reason to not play this. Never wish for battle, Master Gist. There is plenty around here for any of our lifetimes. I'm somewhat burnt out on the Assassin's Creed series. To be honest, I totally skipped over Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, partially because of the pirate theme didn't really interest me at the time, and it was announced only months after the release of Assassin's Creed 3. Something like three months after AC3 hit shelves. At one point in my life, I really enjoyed this series, but then it took the Call of Duty route. Instead of reinventing the series over the duration of a console generation, Ubisoft opted to use minor variations of the same engine and crank out new titles every single year. Wait, how many of these games are there? Liberation HD didn't leave the best taste in my mouth, and Assassin's Creed Unity... well... it's a mess. In fact, I'm too afraid to go through the 5 disc install again, lest I have to deal with another PC crash. And while Ubisoft was marketing Unity as the next big thing, another Assassin's Creed slipped under the radar and almost had no marketing since its E3 reveal. I am so glad I actually cared enough to play Rogue, because it actually gave me some minor faith that the series may redeem itself just yet. Like seriously, why wasn't this game marketed? A apart from the lack of 4 player co-op, I'd almost say it's superior to AC Unity. Che is great. He's human. He's got a moral compass that doesn't always point him in the same direction as his, well, occupation. His rebellious nature leads him into more conflict, and every single choice that he makes, whether it be good or whether it creates even more conflict, is justifiable. He becomes possibly the most badass Templar in the game to date. Now a couple minutes ago I may have said something about me not caring too much about pirates, and apparently I was wrong because I really enjoyed just sailing around doing whatever the heck I feel like on the open seas. And there's something charming about just hearing your crew's positive uproar every time you get back on the ship, or whenever they just break into song, whenever you're just sailing casually from point A to point B. Well yeah, I mean it didn't crash and it looks pretty great, so... EDF! 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 
Seriously though, EDF may not be the best looking game by any means, but if you have a severe, medically induced hatred for bugs, creepy crawlies, or just have the urge to blow things up, EDF 2025 is calling your name. Apart from childhood trauma, I'm drawn to the EDF series due to its use of scale. It seems like very few games master the use of scale when it comes to insanely large enemies and environments. I'm not talking about your set piece part of the stage elements like in God of War, Ninja Gaiden 3, Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Killer is Dead, Yoshi's Island, Odimedius Excellent, Gears of War 3, Dante's Inferno, Lollipop Chainsaw, or Duke Nukem Forever. I'm talking about your giants, your mobile behemoths that haunt the very fabric of the dreamscape. I'm talking about your Bayonetta, your Shadow of the Colossus, your Bayonetta 2. I'm talking about fighting onboard germs and molecules one minute, then fighting the entity behind the conceivable universe in the wonderful 101. Earth Defense Force 2025 has you going toe to toe with giant ants, giant mechs, huge transport ships, mecha Godzilla, a mothership, and in the end, the whole damn sky. Like, if you haven't picked up on this by now, it's pretty freaking awesome. Oh yeah, one more thing. Nintendo gets a lot of flack from hardcore gamers in terms of rehashing used content, focusing on family-friendly entertainment, overusing franchises to the point where they, how should I put it, beat a dead horse? However, one thing most of us can agree on, the Mario Kart franchise is pretty awesome and has been consistently awesome since the Super Nintendo. Whether you're in your 20s and 30s and grew up with Super Mario Kart and Mario Kart 64 on the SNES and, well, Nintendo 64, or you're a little younger and are first experiencing the series through Mario Kart DS, 7, or Mario Kart 8, this saga of action racing games is simply fantastic. And sure, there may be a Mario Kart on almost every single Nintendo platform, but each one brings something new to the series. Mario Kart 64 featured 3D polygonal environments, Double Dash featured interchangeable drivers, DS marked the debut of the super radical Waluigi Pinball track, and Mario Kart 8? While it has a serious case of nostalgia, you get to drive on the ceiling, you're in the air, you're underwater, you're a... bullet bill? Plus, Mario Kart 8 was one of the first Nintendo titles to have DLC. Link in the Master Cycle, a Mercedes-Benz, Shy Guy, which people seem to love. I like big sports and I cannot lie. You other brothers can't deny. You want a girl walks in with a itty bitty waist and a round thing in your face, you get sick. I'm not entirely sure how to describe my thoughts and feelings towards this game, but man, it's really, really something. The visual aesthetic is simply beautiful, and the soundtrack is... strangely haunting, and yet it's really astounding to listen to. I often find myself listening to the vocal tracks over and over, though, as a fair warning, if you fall into the same trap as I did, the music itself contains nods and spoilers for the plot. I don't really know what to say other than I truly love this game.
Do you like Metroid? Are you one of the thousands currently occupying the new 2D Metroid game waiting room? Seriously, how long have you guys been there? Roughly 12 years? Unless I'm mistaken, Metroid Fusion was the last 2D traditional Metroid game, and that released in, oh, I don't know, November of 2002? While the inclusion of a female lead may be one of the only similarities, take it upon yourself to play Shantae and the Pirate's Curse. The Shantae franchise has always been on point with its gameplay, and Pirate's Curse is quite possibly the best installment yet. While it may not have the same interconnected world as Shantae Risky's Revenge, the dungeons and corresponding overworlds are much larger and way more involved than in previous games. Sure, you might not be able to transform into animals like in the other games, but who cares when you've got your nemesis' arsenal of sweet pirate gear at your disposal? Use Risky's hat as a parachute, use her cannon as a jump booster, use Risky's, uh, boots for a shine spark? There's plenty of secrets to find, and even some of those secrets have ultra top secret secrets within the secrets. That's a lot of secrets. Pirate's Curse can probably be completed in four hours or so on the first run, but then you get to go through it again with the speedrun encouraged New Game Plus mode. On top of the updated gameplay, 3D environments, and character portraits, Pirate's Curse features character artwork by Mega Man Zero, Gal Gun, and Azure Striker Gunvolt developer Inti Creates, along with contributions by Skullgirl's creative mastermind Alex Ahad. At the moment, its release is limited to the 3DS and Wii U, but if things go the same way of older games, it may come to the PC later on down the road. But for now, Shantae and the Pirate's Curse remains as the best action-adventure platformer on the 3DS and Wii U, and the best one released in 2014.
I don't really need to say anything for number one. Why? Well, I think you'll understand soon enough.